All right, you ready, man? This beer's got some good foam, man. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it photographed well. It was like a very, almost like a a scarlet head, like a scarlet tan head on it. Yeah, beers, beer I, stouts these days don't have enough bubbles in them. So, so I brewed this one, so it's got bubbles in it. <laughs> The fourth of 2020's 12 Beers of Christmas comes to us from Fair State Brewing Cooperative. Endurance Coffee and Donuts Pastry Stout is a big, decadent imperial stout brewed with donuts, cold-pressed coffee, vanilla beans, and caramelized cocoa nibs. Woo! Fair State's R&D guru, Nico Tonks, shares a glass and tells us about brewing with so many unique ingredients to layer in one beer. And yes, many donuts were harmed in the making of this beer. The 12 Beers of Christmas is brought to you with ongoing support from BSG Handcraft, Imperial Yeast, and the Patreon supporters of Chop and Brew. Join them at patreon.com slash chop and brew. For the fourth beer of Christmas my brew love gave to me, Endurance from Fair State. And also... Brewery. It rhymes. There we go. And my stocking also had Nico Tonks in it, who brewed said beer, Endurance. Nico Tonks... What the hell is this beer? Dark as yeah. night, dark as the yeah. the winterest night. True. So this beer is uh is is what what you know everybody's referring to now as a pastry stout. Um, the the inspiration for this beer is well, there's a lot of inspiration. So we'll talk about the beer first. The yeah. beer is a coffee and donut stout. So um, it's a big boy. Um, I went and got uh, roundabouts a uh, hundred uh, old fashioned donuts. Uh, chocolate old-fashioned donuts from Sarah Jane's uh, in Northeast Minneapolis. And uh, we um, threw those in the mash. Last time I talked to y'all, uh, we were talking about double mashing and the, the Black is Beautiful thing. Yeah. Um, this is definitely a beer that falls into that category. Um, many, many pounds of barley were harmed in the making of this beer. Um, so it's a bunch of donuts. <laughs> it's a bunch of vanilla beans. Um, it's a bunch of these really fun caramelized cocoa nibs. So um, we don't have a commercial kitchen. You know, a lot of people will kind of toast their nibs. This is a super awesome product that I found that actually one of our member owners brought to me, who was a, a chocolate salesman, um, that is pre-caramelized and makes it very, very fun to use and also to snack on. Uh, and then uh, the last sort of ingredient is uh, cold press, um, Costa Rican cold press uh, produced by our friends at Duluth Coffee Company which is super fun. I love working with them and we hadn't worked with them in a super long time. Um, and I sort of thought they were shut down because their retail is shut down, but I sent an email to Sam um, over there and he was like, no, nah, man, we're still making cold press. So it was like one of those fun pandemic surprises where you realize that, you know, people are still there, they're still doing their thing. Um, and uh, yeah. Can still so they just cool. brought you like a keg or a vessel of it and you kind of just infused yep. it in line. Yep. And that's, that's my preferred method for, for coffee beers, frankly. Uh, I think, you know, um, a lot of people will do whole bean or, you know, ground up and do infusions that way. Um, my experience is that you're more likely to pick up the sort of undesirable, um, like raw, raw, like green jalapenos or green, green pepper kind of aromas that way, which I am very much so not, not a fan of. Um, and for, for my money, um, injecting properly crafted cold press, uh, directly into the packaging tank before before kegging is like the best way to do it. Um, so that's what we did here. That said, I, I am not I'm not a coffee guy, frankly. I, I love working with them because they always have a fun a fun new coffee for me to use, and they're very very adept at, at pairing. I can kind of give them notes, and they'll be like, "Yes, we have this. It'll be great." Uh, genetically, I, I'm predisposed to deal poorly with caffeine, so um, oh. I have to I have to kind of be careful with it. But anyway. So the idea with this beer is that coffee and donuts all in one, like vanilla glaze on a big chocolate donut, cake donut. It's, you know, closer to, it's like 12 and a half percent or something like that. Yeah, when, when I set up for this, I was like, I don't need both of these crawlers to myself tonight. So like um, oh, my wife and her mother are like benefiting from, you know, the second half of this upstairs right now. But actually, now that you say that, I forgot to tell them both that it involved coffee. So we'll see how that goes because Elsa and Mommers are both like, yeah, we're not real big on those coffee beers after like, you know, about dinner time. Those are like weekend day drinking beers. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. There, it's, it's, it's not so bad on, on the caffeine because I made it. So there's, uh, they, they, they do like, a, it's a pretty intense uh, cold brew. 
Um, but there's, you know, there's mm, what five gallons of cold press in a, like an eight barrel batch. So it's not, it's not a ton. We wanted to kind of balance out. Sometimes coffee can be kind of overbearing. Um, we wanted to balance that out with the, you know, the, the handcrafted donut aspect of the beer. Talk to me about brewing with donuts. <laughs> you know what, what's really funny. A lot of times when you throw like, you know, the whole trend now is like, well, you do it for the gram, throw, throw whatever it is in the beer. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, donuts work great. Um, they it actually work really well. They, uh, so I mashed in and then very and carefully sort of laid the donuts on top of the mash. And then, um, yeah, it was, it was, <laughs> it was, it was, it was dumb, but, uh, whatever. And I ate a donut and that was great. Um, and then, you know, about three minutes into the sparge, the donuts had completely liquefied. So it was like, it was like the mash had, had like chocolate frosting on top of it, essentially. Um, and cool. the lather went fine. Everything went totally fine. It was shocking. Um, no big deal. I really thought that would be the worst part of my day. The longest part of my day was that for these beers, often you do a very, very long boil. So I was just there sort of like kicking dirt around uh, boiling this beer for eight hours. Uh, eight before, hours. Yeah. Before I knocked it out. Yeah. Like in a single brew or like, and I don't want to go down the rabbit hole, but like, or did you, yeah. is this a we're, we're right back down the double mass rabbit hole. So this was a two day, this was a two day project. It's a seven barrel brew house or seven and a half barrel brew house. I netted about 13 barrels. I had to brew three times to get, okay. to get 13 barrels out of it. So, so not boiling first, a single batch for eight hours, but boiling. I did. No, I did. I boiled the first one, the first day I boiled, you know, two hours, an hour and a half, pretty normal. Um, and the second day added all of the sugar on top of it and then boiled it for eight hours. Damn. Yeah. So it's a long day. <laughs> and it tastes great. Yeah, thanks. It, I don't know. I feel like it gestures at, at coffee and donuts. Yeah. It's nice. Coffee isn't there's, too... no, there's no lactose in it. So, you know, it's more accessible that way. It's interesting. The more I learn about long boiled beers and then taste them, I really think that that long boil might as well be considered an ingredient. This shit should say like long boiled imperial stout with blank because I yeah. really think like that does yeah. a lot to it. You know what the other the other like secret thing that that I am still working on really wrapping my head around it and not I mean I understand it conceptually but you know doing it is that so often when we're brewing beers pH management is important because we need to be bringing the pH down but when you're brewing beers like this huge gigantic beers like this actually we need to be bringing the pH up because there's so much buffer in the malt uh, that we, you know, usually all knock out and our pH is like 4.7 or 4.8, right? And we want it to be above five. This is a, a trick I picked up. Okay, I'm just blasting it out there. A trick I picked up from the Bottle Logic guys in California, you know, that that really those malt flavors tend to pop with the pH a little bit higher. And so, you know, if you're looking to do this as a home brewer, I would, I would invest in, uh, you know, getting, getting some chalk on hand, making sure you can get your pH above five um, into the fermenter really seems to help bring out the sort of the nuance of all of the different malts. Like if you're going to put 12 malts and a hundred donuts and <laughs> you know, a half pound per barrel of vanilla beans in a thing, like you should probably do all the things you can do to, to drag out all those flavors. I'm going to keep drinking pills in the background. Man, look at you. Did you say get a little chalk on hand? It kind of cut out slightly. Okay. Yeah, yeah exactly. So essentially buffer. Um, straight up chalk is the easiest thing to use. Um, to make sure that your pH isn't dropping too low. So normally, you know, I would acidify the mash a little bit. I would acidify the sparge water a little bit. Forget all of that. And actually, you know, your, your, your lower bound is what you're worried about more than your upper bound. Uh, and it's because of the, you know, all, the, all those dark malts, all the crystal malts and everything, and especially that long boil is going to drag that pH down a little bit. And then you mentioned... I like how this hot, this little lighted up thing keeps like dimming and lighting up as if like it's opening and closing for the day. I can't Goodness see it, you over can't my, here. So, so you're, you're I can't good. it over my own shoulder. Um, <laughs> it's like Beetlejuice is in there and he's messing with my hop shop, hop stop. Um, you mentioned bubbles, right? You said stouts don't have uh, as many bubbles as you would. I, I feel like these days be a part, part of the, I feel like lower, lower carbonation is kind of a, an industry-wide trend in, in a few different ways. Um, but definitely stouts, especially like the big, thick, barrel-aid stouts, people err on the lower side of carbonation. And I get it, and I understand, and you don't, you know, you don't want to thin it out. It's weird because normally we're tasting a, a regular strength beer. So like, you know, yesterday, for the purposes of the video, we're talking about pills, right? 
drinking that out of the fermenter flat, it's got a lack of body and, and adding the bubbles to it is going to help bring up that body and bring up the aroma. Too many bubbles. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, with, with beers with so much residual body, so much residual sugar in there, actually, if you add, if you're adding too many bubbles to it, you can kind of thin it out and it, it gets kind of sparkly and it, and it sort of erodes the impression of, of the sort of middleness of the, the, the malt body. Um, so, yeah, I understand that. I, to me, it feels like carving things to, to two volumes or 2.1 is just too low. Um, and, you know, so we went for a massive like 2.4 on this one. Um, but it's nice. It's just, I, I appreciate seeing like good head formation and good head retention. To me, it's just a sign that a beer has been well-made, you know, and somebody was thinking about the basics when they did it. So, and, I think of this and it's beer being carbonated and all I can think of was like bubbles rising up to like motor oil or like Hershey's well, yeah. chocolate. That does. It's super funny when you pour it on tap, you're like, Oh, I, the first time I did it, I was like, Oh man, I really thought I got the carb right. And you set it down and 30 seconds later, boom, there, there's the head on top. I've never tried doing a nitro version of a beer like this. That's this sort of motor oil E, but I wonder whether it would be like a 10 minute pour in the sense that you have to set it down and like you, you're you not seeing any bubbles, but you come back and it's going to be half foam, you know, five minutes later. I thought of a ridiculous series just to go like speaking of doing it for the gram, like just for like the viral potential of a mini series within Chop and Brew called like, will it carbonate mm. and trying to carbonate like milk, mouthwash motor oil like i don't know why but somebody will watch i used to watch people microwave you know laptops just to well, see what will covers. it blend is a, is a classic yeah right yeah right, right. I mean, yeah. yeah no no I, I would i would happily be like a guest panelist on that show if you put it together <laughs> will we carbonate so the other thing like, uh you know like strawberry jam you know like how how, how thinned out does does honey have to be to get carbonated yeah oh my gosh but back to something more serious, I want to talk about, so this is the launch beer, essentially, of a really interesting project um, through Fair State. Kind of talk about that, because I really like, it almost like kind of tears at your heart a little bit when you hear the setup uh, of why we need to be kind of like, oh, let's think about this project to make everybody stay a little sane, right? Yeah, for sure. So, so the name of the beer is Endurance, which is a reference to um, the 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 name of um sir ernest shackleton's uh antarctic uh, exploration vessel um that was that got caught in the sea ice uh, north of antarctica it's easy to say north because everything is north of antarctica um in the 19 teens um i think so they got they got caught in the ice uh they got stuck there over the winter it's this insane story that everybody should look up um they nobody died which is crazy they, they ended up having to, they sent a party out across the, the ship, like got crushed under, you know, between some ice after, after getting stranded um, for a few months there. And uh, they sent a, a rescue party out. They, you know, they had to make it to an Island. They came back months later, everybody made it. It's this insane story. Um, and so, and the, what, one of the really, really crazy things about it is that because it's a 20th century story, there are tons of photographs, tons of photographs from this expedition. There's actually even some, some film, some video um, that you can look at. So it's one of these, these things where it's a piece of history that feels like it's from a different era, but you can actually go look at the photos of it happening. Um, and I was just, I was thinking about, you know, cause we had resolved uh, to not do indoor service over the winter, kind of no matter what, pretty much early on, because our tap room is just not well set up. Um, you know, we, we don't have a giant space. It's not easy for us to do retrofits to the HVAC to try to do air exchange in there. And it just didn't feel, even if it was legal, it didn't feel safe for our staff um, and, and the people coming in either to do sort of any, any version, even like a pared down version of indoor service. And so we really, we were kind of doubling down on like, okay, how do we do outdoor service? We don't want to do like the dome bubble thing, because again, I don't, I don't understand how that's COVID appropriate. I'm sure people have figured it out, but so it's like, all right, it's going to be a tent. It's, we're going to get a lot of heaters. It's going to be open on a couple sides. Like we really just need to kind of strap in and, and, you know, be ready to, to grin and bear it through this, how do we bring people together? And so endurance was the theme and it's, you know, taking inspiration from this story about how, you know, if it's like, it's a, it's shared sacrifice, it's going to be a long crappy winter. Um, we're, you know, we set out to do it. We said, we're going to do this until 
until uh, you know the dawn of meteorological spring at the very least, and we expect to fail. Like we expect to fail in the same way that that they failed uh, on the trip. Like you know, there's going to be times where we get snowed out. Like there's going to be times where it's just ten below zero, and it's like, okay, fine, maybe you should stay home. But this is the the whole thing is building the winter around figuring out how how to endure through what is what is coming down the pike right now um, and doing it in a way that that helps us all see the other side of it so right now we're because we're all shut down rightfully so not complaining about it not doing any any in-person service at all right now um, it's become endure at home which was always part of the plan um, but yeah there's a bunch of fun fun programming uh, around it and and uh, I encourage people to check out the website and the social media to learn more about it. Um, you know, if and when we are able to do outdoor, outdoor service again, it will be sort of the, the guiding light of, of what we're doing um, over the winter. And, uh, and yeah, that's, that's the story. And there's other beers within this series. So this is endurance stout. Well, so this like beer is kind of the umbrella beer for okay. it. Um, and we're, there, there are many, many insane beverage plans for the winter. Yeah. Um, just this week we rolled out we're doing um, we're doing like beer lattes in 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 half gallon beer uh, like milk jugs, uh, you know. So it's we're just throwing everything at the wall, kind of seeing what sticks. Uh, you know, we had a really fun time over the summer doing fruity booms, which were our like sl beer slushies uh, yeah. in pouches to go. This is kind of the the winter version of that. Yeah, so this is, yeah, yeah, it's you know it's yeah we're just we're just trying to have as much fun as we possibly can and and hope other people have fun too. So, yeah, it's and then the other the other portion of of how we're trying to get the the taproom experience to kind of come through the winter this winter in, in a safe way is uh, we have a program now called Taproom Direct where um, we're we're really trying to bring um, so we you know we exist as a distribution brewery. It's a hugely important part of our business, but we also exist as a taproom brewery. And it's a, you know, it's a big part of, of who we are is, is doing new beers and kind of throwing stuff at the wall and seeing how people like it. And, you know, you know, really just being reactive and moving, moving quickly and, and doing new stuff. So that type of experience, unfortunately, is what we, we don't have right now. So we're doing, um, we've launched a twice a week pickup in, uh, on, at the Ramsey County campus um, at our, at our production brewery in St. Paul. And we're also going to be doing um, sort of pop-up uh, like tap room deliveries um, at Pizza Luce locations around the metro uh, starting at the end of next week. So 1217, I think, is the first day where, um, and people can check out the website, um, where every day of the week we're, we're popping up at a different Pizza Luce, whether it be like Eden Prairie or Roseville or, you know, Hopkins or whatever it is. Um, and bringing those beers that like people can't get without coming to the tap room, otherwise uh, bringing them to their closer to their face. Um, and also partnering with Social Cider Works. That's another fun thing that we're able to do with this is that like bring beer and cider, why not? You know, one, one, one stop shop. Um, yeah. They're our buds and uh, we love working with them. Yeah, I'm interested to see what kind of comes out of breweries this winter because I feel like it's going to have to be a lot of these kind of things, right? That bring the fan base together in a way that's more than just like, oh, do you follow them on social or you know, it's gonna have to be like, you're really gonna have to like kind of buy, well, that's why I became a member of Fair State. I was just like, yep. Like all the other reasons, then St. Paul pickup slash delivery. I was just like, I, this is something I wanna support and make sure oh, if nothing else, it makes it the winter, but also 10 years from now, we're looking back at this and just kind of like shaking it off a little bit. Yeah, no, for real. And you know, we're, I, it's important for me and I think for all of us to kind of keep it in perspective, right? Like there are, um, there are, there are real legitimate concerns about our ability to stay in business and, and, and making sure that all the people that work for us continue to have employment, you know, and, and all the, the things that have been invested in the business keep going. But at the same time, you know, it's a brewery. And there are, there are, there are more important things happening in the world that we need to make sure continue. So, it's a balance. Um, and, and that, that being said, it's been, it's been really, uh, incredible how, how people, because as you just alluded to, you really kind of have to go out of your way to support a local brewery right now. Like you can't roll up and do samples, you know, it, it's, you really, you have to plan ahead. And so the fact that people are planning ahead and they're spreading it around and they're supporting a bunch of different places is huge. And, and all of us are very, very, 
appreciative of that. You know, it'd be it'd be great if you know, say for example, the federal government could get off their butts uh, and and figure something out for everybody. But you know, we as far as support from the community goes, zero complaints. It's been stunning, uh, and you know, I, at least me personally, I've been really taking it as a as an imperative to turn it around and and, and do that for as many other people as I possibly can. Throw down bananas tips on whatever takeout I'm getting, you know. Yeah. Oof. All right, that's real talk on beer number four of the twelve beers of Christmas, courtesy of Nico Tonks, the Fair State brother. I appreciate it. This was good. Cheers. Fun. Yeah. And just balance the serious stuff with the fact that it's a twelve and a half percent coffee and donut stout. Like it's stupid and it's serious all at once. I'm getting sentimental. <laughs> Happy holidays. Cheers. I usually sing as a setup. I didn't do it on the third because I was trying to look professional, but now that I got a little beer running through me. Very good. On the fourth beer of Christmas, my true brew. Ah, I fucked it up, bro. Now it's going in the blooper reel.